Good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning from wherever you're joining us from today. My name's Chris Thorne. I'm Senior Manager for Field Marketing here at TWIST. Uh, and welcome to today's TWIST Bioscience webinar, Developing Stable Heterogeneous Enzymes for Fine Chemical Production. So it is a webinar, uh, and yes, your lines will be muted uh, for the duration, but if you do have questions, you can put them into the Q&A box um, at the bottom, uh, and we'll be taking time at the end to answer those. And so uh, you can see him on the webcam. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Matthew Thompson. Welcome, Matthew. Matthew is the Director of Enzyme Engineering at Enzyme. With over five years of experience in biocatalysis, he leads a multidisciplinary team of protein engineers and computational biologists to design stable enzymes for Enzyme's biocatalysis catalyst, excuse me, Matthew, and process development. Uh, prior to joining Enzyme, Matthew completed his PhD in biocatalysis with Professor Nicholas Turner at the University of Manchester, where he worked on high throughput protein engineering, chemoenzymatic cascades, and biocatalysis in continuous flow. Right, so I've managed to say that at least the three times, so I'll happily hand over to you to, to take it from here, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. And it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for everyone for taking the time to uh, listen to me today. So I'm going to start by introducing Enzyme. Uh, we are a synthetic biology company based in Stockholm, Sweden. We were founded in 2014 and we were a spin-out company from the Arrhenius Laboratories at Stockholm University. From that point in time, we've, we've grown significantly from a, a ragtag team of two or three people up to a group now of, of more than 30 people, majority of us sitting in R&D. We now also have offices both in Sweden, in the UK, and, and partner offices across the US. Our main objective is to unlock the potential of enzymes and make chem chemistry that is sustainable a real reality using them. Uh, we sit across us four pillars, uh, the first being our cell-free synthetic biology platform. Uh, that's really core to everything that what we're doing. Uh, we're taking enzymes from nature and we're producing stable heterogeneous biocatalysts that we then consider to deploy in continuous flow for, for fine chemical production. The reason we do this is to address key drivers for the, for the chemical industry, namely to produce novel products that would be not accessible without using biological systems, but also to reduce carbon footprint and to meet customer demands for bio-based products. The, the way we accomplish this is all really based off our core technology, which is ECG. This is a universal enzyme immobilization technology that's derived from controlled pore glass. It's a really high performance material and it's extremely porous. And this allows us to immobilize essentially any enzyme uh, free from crude solutions. And it's a key enabler to all of our cell-free synthetic biology technologies. And we're in the very fortunate position of being a really strong and well-backed team. So as I said, we're now a group of more than 30 people, the majority of us sitting in, in different parts of R&D group. Uh, and, and we really invest very heavily to, to drive all of our process development uh, through automation and the use of, of information technologies and, and limb systems. And we're also very fortunate to be backed by a number of, of venture capitalists, uh, most recently announcing an extension to our Series A, to taking our, our Series A round to approximately 11 million euros, which was really exciting news for us. So to summarize what Enzyme really sets out to do uh, in terms of the synthetic biology space, we're really focusing on taking systems that you find in nature, just enzymes, be they single step reactions or be they multi-step reactions. And from there, we take the enzymes that would ordinarily be found inside of living cells. And instead of trying to do this fermentatively, we assemble enzymatic cascades. So we take the enzymes out of cells and we mobilize them instead onto our, our proprietary glass material, making them essentially heterogeneous. This use of the heterogeneous catalyst gives us the advantage then of being able to take them towards a fixed bed reactor. And this is the standard mode of, mode of chemistry that's used across the fine chemical sector. So as soon as you start seeing very large scale chemistries, you start finding yourself using heterogeneous catalysts in fixed beds. And this, this use of existing scalable industry equipment is, going to allow, is what's going to allow us to infiltrate markets that enzymes haven't really been able to hit, for, hit earlier. And this then acting in, in continuous enzymatic processes, multi-step with all the downstream trains is really the core of what Enzyme's technology is all about. For us then, our technology is, is great, of course, uh, and, and stands to itself to, to explain why, why we think it is attractive. But really when it comes down to it, 
what we really drive value from is showing cost comparisons and, and overall savings versus the competitive technologies. And that in general is fermentation technologies. Right. And so what we expect from, from a lot of our processes is that we can get, generate high space time yields because we have very compact reactors with high concentrations of catalysts. We get predictable scale ups. We know how things behave once the catalyst is heterogeneous at the small scale. We know how we expect that to behave through a number of scales all the way up to, to commercial scale plants. The biggest advantage driving uh, many processes is simplifying downstream processing. Uh, and compared to fermentation processes, having immobilized enzymes that are not fouling in your downstream feeds is a big advantage for downstream processing. And lastly, capital operating costs from using existing equipment and existing formats that you find in industry is really advantageous in terms of driving down the cost. And you see a, a rough comparison from an FEL1 assessment showing our anticipated gains against an existing fermentation process for, for a particular target molecule that we were interested in. As I mentioned earlier, EZG is really the key enabler to our technology. And I wanted to just go back a little bit and, and give a, a history lesson as to, as to what this material is. So we start from a base of controlled porosity glass, and then we're exploiting chelating mechanisms similar to IMAC chromatographies in addition to surface properties to immobilize the enzymes directly. We do this from crude mixtures. This saves a lot of downstream processing steps in terms of potential needs for purification from upstream fermentations of the enzyme. What this gives us then is a material that's extremely porous. It has extremely good properties in terms of flow dynamics for continuous flow processes. Uh, and we expect to get very high enzyme retention because we're not relying on traditional enzyme immobilization mechanisms such as cross-linking and covalent attachment. We get very high activity retention. We're using an inert binding mode. And secondly, the very porous nature of that material means we get extremely high surface area to volume ratios, which means we can load very, very large amounts of enzyme onto the support. The advantage of that then is that we don't increase the volume of, that, of the catalyst required um, by expanding it onto a very bulky support, uh, which, is, which is disadvantageous if you're thinking about large scale chemistries. And this is something that we have previously demonstrated us and, and a, a number of uh, groups, academic groups, in addition to work that we've done for, for ourselves and for customers across all manner of enzyme uh, types with multiple cofactor dependent enzymes, multi-domain proteins, and all sorts of uh, different kinds of enzyme chemistries. So the, we, are, we have convinced ourselves and we have shown multiple times that, that EZG is really a, a general method for immobilizing enzymes. And for a long time, we focused on this as, a, as an area of interest. Uh, this was really where Enzyme started, was, was immobilizing enzymes for, for customers and, and for ourselves. But since then, we've, we've really moved on in our, in our portfolio. Uh, we, we, for all intents and purposes, have solved the enzyme immobilization problem for us. And so we turn our attention to enzymatic biomanufacturing process development. And what that entails for us then is a very broad span of capabilities that we now have within Enzyme, from taking enzymes all the way from discovery and engineering all the way through to the process engineering, where we de-risk scale up when we understand and, and can develop all of the downstream process steps, all of the, reactor all of the reactor steps that we need. And a big advantage of, of Enzyme is that all of these groups are in, in very tight collaboration at all times. We rely on a lot of front end loading for our process development so that before we even get something to the lab, our groups have understood what are the risks for this process? What is the downstream train going to look like? Where are we going to hurt in this process? And it's a, it's a really tight knit group that spans all the way from the enzyme engineering group through the immobilization groups and all the way up to the process engineering groups and tied all together and linked very tightly by the automation groups that allow us to constantly find ways of doing all of this work faster and more reliably. Focusing particularly on the enzyme engineering group, which is the group that I lead, our, our core competencies span all the way from enzyme discovery all the way through to bioprocess engineering. And in the middle, we have in silico enzyme design, high throughput screening capabilities, and also the addition of, of machine learning to understand how to improve and design more stable enzymes, uh, relying on the data that we're generating as a function of time. And what that group is really focused on is producing stable biocatalysts that we can then take through to the biocatalyst groups to do the, the generation of the mobilized enzymes and the process development. And so we're really supporting from a very early stage, identifying very stable enzymes. 
I wanted to actually just very briefly highlight why my group is interested particularly in stable enzymes. Um, you can think in many areas of protein engineering and enzyme engineering that you wish to engineer towards activity. And this is true largely in the, in the API space where the scales of molecules are not enormously high. And often you're looking at structural motifs that maybe are not familiar in biology. Whereas when we get to the fine chemical space, the volumes are so much higher that the kind of processing modes, for example, for us, continuous processing modes, change in such a way that it's just not feasible to need to constantly replenish catalysts. And so where Enzyme has identified that we really succeed in process development is making enzymes extremely stable. We can take sacrifices to some extent on, on activity, but if we can get an enzyme that's going to last continuously operating for a very long period of time, and we're talking weeks to months, then we can make molecules that are extremely cheap. Uh, and this is something that we combine together, of course, with the enzyme immobilization strategy, where you expect that you would improve enzyme enzyme stability to a large extent. We combine that together then with, with my group's expertise in making already extremely stable enzymes. How do we do that? Well, very, very, at a very high level, starting from an enzyme identification step, which is really where the front end loading for our process development comes in, that before we even think about taking a process to the lab, we've, we already know what molecule we're trying to make. We already understand the downstream train. We already understand a lot about whether or not we even know whether that enzyme exists. So we can take for granted now that we've, we've gone through the necessary enzyme discovery steps and we have a candidate that, that meets the activity needs that we have for the, for the process development. And from that point, we may be suffering in terms of stability. We always prioritize active, finding the right activity over stability in the first instance. So from that point, we're then going to design the enzyme and make an initial exploration of what kind of mutations we can expect to introduce to that protein. But more importantly, we're looking for the kind of features that improve this enzyme instability. Sometimes it's flexibility, sometimes flexible residues that are just on loops and things like this. Other times it can be a lot to do with helix capping. Other times it can be hydrophobic packing. We, we don't know before we start. And so really at this stage is all about exploring different types of interactions and understanding what in our modeling is giving us a good indication for improved stability of these proteins. Once we go through that process, we've often introduced low numbers, three, maybe 10, 20 mutations into the, into the protein at a time. Once we go through that process, we can start learning what features are good, what should we keep in this protein, and what do we need to do in order to go back and redesign this. So I'm going to give a very brief case study uh, for a particular, a particular enzyme where it, was, it had already gone through some work and it was, it was not so far away from where we needed to get it to go. So we have activity that's, that's already high enough, more than, than one unit per milligram. We have our lifetime target of three months at 50 degrees, and we need a melt temperature that's above 75 degrees. And I would also say that this is product, should be a melt temperature that is dominated by thermodynamic contributions. So we can't have slow kinetically melting proteins. That, that really is disadvantageous for us. Uh, so we really want something that, that melts quite thermodynamically. Uh, at this point, we'd got ourselves up to 72. So we're, we're nearly there. We're not, we're not too far away. Uh, but our lifetime is still more than a month. It's still less than a month because of that sort of kinetic unfolding that we're, behavior that we're seeing. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of the, of the work that we put into this guy. So the first thing that we do is, is build models of these proteins. So I showed you on the other side that it was a homodimer, but we were interested in understanding the monomer. This is the, the fully solvated molecular dynamics model. The reason we use molecular dynamics is because we believe that it gives the most representative solution phase structure. Uh, crystal structures often contain certain artifacts that when you start making in silico designs, you can carry over those artifacts into your design and they don't really represent reality. So we put a lot of work in to try and build the most solution phase representative structure that we can get to. Uh, and, and that's it. So you can see there's a few areas of this protein highlighted that are particularly flexible relative to the backbone. So their RMSD is, is, is higher than the average for this, for this protein. And this is something we might think about targeting in our next design steps. So when we, when we think about doing in silico design, one of our big priorities is to try and identify as many possible mutations that we could introduce without introducing too many false positives. Uh, so we really focused our, our strategy here on, on how can we identify as many aggressive changes as possible, but without 
muddying the waters without screening empty space. Um, we have the high throughput capabilities to do it, but it is, it's unnecessary and it's wasteful for us to do so. So we've really worked to try and, and, and streamline this workflow. So if we take that, that protein from the, the first page, and we say that there is about 500 residues in it, that's an enormous combinatorial space. And even a single mutation that would require us to seek to search approximately 9,000 single mutations. And that's, that's quite a lot for us to do. Um, so what we start with is a phylogenetic filter, uh, simply aligning against homologs that we can find, even distant hol homologs using hidden marker models. And we, we search through phylogenetic space to try and reduce the number of mutations to only mutations that we can say have occurred previously. Um, so we're eliminating any mutations that we, have, we cannot find amongst distal hol homologs. And we go from then 9,000 mutations to approximately 1,800 single mutations that have occurred in, in this protein previously, or in homologs of this protein previously. From there, we're applying a number of atomistic filters. Um, we're basically calculating the, the estimated delta delta G of making all of the allowed single mutations from the first filter uh, and estimating what the expected delta delta G of introducing those changes would be uh, across all of these positions. And you can see that the, the bottom graph is the distribution of expected delta delta Gs. These calculations are often not very accurate. Uh, this is something that most people can accept that the accuracy of single position mutation changes calculated is, if you're on a good day, around 70%. So we're quite conservative at this step. And we take only the positions that are definitely showing a negative delta delta G. That is that they are, they are calculated to contain a predicted improvement. We could, of course, be more aggressive and allow certain positive mutations, positive delta delta G values, but we, we choose not to because you can see we're already with a very, very large number of, of possible mutations. The last step in this is to make sure that all of those mutations play nicely together. Uh, this is a really important step because even though the single mutations were allowed, you do often find antagonistic effects. Uh, and so we, we try and filter even further uh, by combining all possible mutations together in, in a massive multi-site recombination experiment in silico, where we distill this down now to 60 mutations that we predict have followed through from the phylogenetic step all the way down to being uh, playing nicely with all of the other mutations. And then the very last step is an optimal distance sequence search. So we take all of the 60 mutations and we distribute them as evenly as possible across uh, across space so that we can subsequently screen a relatively small number of sequences, but still deconvolute the expected contribution of each of those mutations. And this is where we use, where we use twist. We, we basically define sequences that we need and we, we exploit the fact that they produce very good, high quality, cheap DNA for us. And we search that space as, as efficiently as possible. Um, we at the moment choose not to search through libraries. Um, simply because we want to the, the define sequences that we search to match exactly what we have designed in silico. Uh, we don't wish to search space where we don't know exactly what our computational uh, colleagues are expecting to get from those sequences. And then lastly, the, this then hits our high throughput workflows. So um, high throughput expression, cultivation, high throughput purification, uh, the reason purification is, is very simple. We have so few variants. We have anything from 10 to 100 variants that we can afford to do very high quality assays on them. So it's not, it's not beneficial for us to screen them in crude live sites. It's much easier for us to purify them uh, using either our supports or I might chromatography methods and then subject them to very high quality assays. So be they, in this case, I've just shown a, a onset of melting assay, but we also subject them to aggregate assays, activity assays, measures of relative soluble expression, insoluble expression, all sorts of uh, other assays that we can come up with for the specific reactions that we're interested in. Um, and then from that, of course, we, we then seek to learn. And in this particular case, what I'm showing is one of the particular um, energy scores from uh, the predicted model that correlated very well with the TM. And this is not always true, um, of course, but we're, we're trying to show here that we learn from this data to then understand which mutations we should keep, which mutations we should kick out, and, and also more importantly for building better models next time, which particular features that we're extracting from the in silico models are predictive of uh, improvements to the features that we're looking for. And to summarize, in, in this particular experiment, we, we search only 22 variants. 
Um, all 22 of them uh, were expressed perfectly solubly. The maximum TM that we reached was 85 degrees, the onset being around 76, which is 60%. 60% of all of the, the variants that we searched were better than the wild type. The maximum onset there is actually there, 79. It was an error for me. And then one of the things that we did sacrifice a little bit that we may wish to go back and look at again is the activity. So we, we did recover up to 70% of the target activity, but we did see some losses, uh, which is unfortunate. But one of the benefits of having these very high quality assays is that we can afford to measure in multiple dimensions. So we can, we can select features that improve stability without sacrificing activity, for example. And that's, that's really what, what it comes through in the, in the learn step. And the final design that we selected out of this uh, actually contained 28 mutations, which is um, not so bad for a, a single a single step evolution from, from zero mutations at the start to, to 28 here. And then we go back to the in silico model, uh, now trying to apply the molecular dynamics model again to see if we've improved this protein. And it's now you've, it's been a while since you saw the reference point, but the flexibility in all of those regions has been reduced. Uh, which, was, which was nice to see that the uh, in silico experiment correlated well with, with what we had observed. So that was, that was really my story of uh, how the protein engineering team and the enzyme engineering team fits into the whole story for, for Enzyme. Uh, but I wanted to go back and say that none of this would be possible, of course, without the dedication of the rest of the teams. The process engineering teams are, is the, really the, the guys driving that this enzyme is not having the lifetime on the solid support uh, that we needed to. So can you go back and design us something that, that's going to behave better? And likewise, the mobilization teams are, are the ones saying that we would like to see these particular surface properties, or we need to see these particular features in the enzyme that's going to help us get the immobilization yields up. Uh, so this is really a group effort, and it's it's a fantastic team to work with. And uh, with no, without any further ado, I'm very grateful for you all taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you, Matthew. That was uh, fantastic. Really, really interesting. And there's a, a few questions coming in already, but I'll, I'll just remind our audience that if you do have questions, um, you can put them in uh, in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom and we'll handle them there. So um, I guess I just, from, from my point of view, just wanted to ask a, a couple of questions straight out of the gate. So um, in, in, in terms of the actual quantities of, of enzyme that you're having to produce for some of these um, uh, these processes uh, for fine chemical production. Could you, could you give me an idea of, of what sort of scales you're, you're actually working at yourself at Enzyme or? You know? Yeah, sure. So internally, we are able to generate 100 gram quantities. That's really to support what our own internal development. Um, for the final processes, we're looking at multi kilo scale, but not not mm. much higher than that in terms of the, the final enzyme uh, it's required, because we expect such long lifetimes from them, yeah. we actually don't need such overbearingly large quantities of enzyme, but internally, we can support ourselves all the way through to the, the beginnings of our pilot campaigns now. And then and then beyond that, right now, we, we cannot do that here in Stockholm. So given the stability, then you, you're not necessarily having to optimize around uh, sort of Product, production quantities then, for, for example, it's a, you're able to usually get the amounts you need and-, and you know, So far it's, it's been, so far it's been okay. Uh, yeah. We, yeah, we, we also, one of the, the other things that we are looking for in the engineering group as we go through is things that express very highly. So this is mm -hmm. something where we, we are trying to minimize potential problems downstream, especially as we're thinking about multi-step enzyme cascades we don't, we don't wish to have six enzymes that are going to be a pain to get hold of on, on the kind of scales we need them to. So we, we, try, and, we try and iron that out throughout the, the process development. Yeah. Um, so question from one of our audience members, uh, Yashraj, um, and this is sort of related, which is, um, uh, do you optimize activity and stability at each step of design? Uh, or do you do it sequentially? And I, I think we saw you, you looking at those, those multiple yeah. parameters, right? But, but I have a sort of related question, which is, do you go through multiple rounds of, of enzyme evolution trying to sort of move the, the sliders, if you like, in, on different parameters? Uh, so the answer to that is, is yes to both. So we, we do them simultaneously. And that's really driven by the fact that we get this high quality data where we can we can extract both variables and we try and optimize towards both activity, stability, expressibility, so multiple variables simultaneously. 
Um, whether we always reach that that point, that's a that's of course not always the case, uh, and so we do often find ourselves going through multiple rounds. And um, preferably, we are always optimizing towards uh, all features that we deem to be of interest. Uh, but we do find ourselves going through multiple rounds, and I think one of the one of the areas where we are seeking to improve, and that's really where the, the the advent of machine learning is helping us, is understanding and being able to quantify in advance what do we expect our improvement to be. So we know that okay, from from this we're going to get this far, and we know already that we're going to have to do this again. Mm. Um, so a question from uh, Tom Moody. Uh, good to see you again, Tom. So we uh, and I'm. I'm going to read it out verbatim, but um, yep. hopefully uh, you'll be able to interpret the question. So how do you perform aqueous insoluble substrates in flow with a packed bed uh, with an immobilized catalyst? So it, aqueous insoluble. Uh, in, yeah, insoluble yep. substrate. Yeah. So we can run biphases, of course. Okay. Uh, so far, one of the selection criteria for a lot of what we've been doing has been that we can make sure we get things soluble. Um, the, the same question comes up a lot, uh, and thanks, Tom, for the question, is, is how do we regenerate cofactors? And that's something that I, I hope we can come back to in a, in a future talk uh, of, of how, we, how we deal with and are dealing with that, uh, because that's the same problem for, for continuous reactors. But mm -hmm. since we're using glass as the immobilization support, um, it's non-swelling, it's inert, so we can, we can use um, biphasic mixtures of, of you name it, solvent uh, without any particular problem. That mm. causes some mixing issues and of course that causes some, some issues of um, partitioning coefficients, but it is possible for us to do it. Mm. Okay, uh, and a, a, another quick question from Tom actually, so um, how fast is your engineering from from gene to modeling to wet protein testing. And, and I, just to add to that, where, where do you see there's still challenges that remain in terms of shortening those timelines? Mm -hmm. So an average timeline is anywhere between 12 weeks to 16 weeks for a single cycle. Um, and, and out of that, we're more than 60% successful in, in hitting our, our goals for, from a single round. Mm. Um, the areas for, for improvement. So I think that there are two. Uh, the first one being that a lot of the in silico work is is quite computationally demanding. We can scale it out. We have we're very fortunate in Sweden to have a lot of high performance computing facilities. It's nice and cold here, so uh, the the cores stay nice and chilled. Um, but still, parallelizing that to a scale that can be run sort of from one day to the next is is still a bit of an outstanding challenge. And so. Mm -hmm. For me, this is where building extremely good models for machine learning is going is to turn the key for us, that instead of relying on heavy computation in the beginning, we, build, we will instead rely on heavy training one time and then have very fast models that reduce the computation time, because that is still very limiting for us, that it can take us three weeks to, to build a good in silico model. Got you. Uh, and then the second one is, is, of course, the race to the bottom for DNA. Now, you guys are, are still the fastest. It takes you two or three weeks, um, but that's the race to the bottom. The, the three weeks is as long as it took me to do the in silico work. And I think yeah. that, that that is, you know, it's, it's a race to the bottom for that. Yeah. Well, it's a race we're ready to compete in, Matty. So uh, yeah. we're still in there, definitely. So I actually have a related question from our, from our very own Ross Kettlebrough, actually, which is pertains to the machine learning. So machine learning is driven by data. Uh, do you get enough data to learn enough or would saturating certain enzymes in a class allow you to learn more and i guess this comes back to your choice of working on uh genes versus libraries potentially uh, or, in, or yeah so one of the things that we are particularly interested in is general machine learning models that are not specific to certain proteins mm. uh, so in that case we're relying on a lot of in silico a lot of existing data in databases uh, for, for language models. However, uh, the idea of saturating certain proteins and building up basically complete maps of, of proteins is very attractive for doing certain types of greedy optimizations um, on, on towards stability. So it is something that we have considered. Um, the reason that we choose not to do it is because we have, have never really got ourselves into the place where we could do the same high quality assays on so many data points. Mm. Uh, so for us, it's it's we would be sacrificing a lot in terms of the quality of data we could could get if we were trying to screen through ten thousand different 
uh, individual protein sequences. But I, I, I think that once we reach that point with other types of high throughput assays, um, then it's going to be really exciting. So for me, the, the combination eventually of ultra high throughput screening, so sort of mm. mass spec type screenings, uh, combined with, with both very, very diverse libraries and then NGS sequencing thereafter is going to be really kind of game changing on the discovery of, of enzymes and, and how to build these kind of models. Yeah. If I, if I recall the um, biophysical instrumentation in terms of protein analysis hasn't quite sort of expanded to super high throughput yet. No, so, uh, there, is a, there is actually a video of me on the internet, which I, I, I love um, talking about our high throughput capabilities and it somehow cuts to me doing an SDS page, which is fantastic. <laughs> yes, one can have only, only run so many actors in, in parallel. Exactly. Right? Yeah, understood. So a few practical questions about your, your pro process. So one from yeah. Lucas Darlin, do you ever use folding helper proteins or chaperones to stabilize the proteins of interest? We have not. Um, we have to be pretty ruthless in our process development that we, we, we're trying to minimize fuss and having to have chaperones, having to the same thing with we actually right now only use E. coli for the same reason that we're trying to really minimize fuss. So um, the, this this old adage of fail fast comes true here that if, if it needs a chaperone is, and there is an alternative available, it's going mm -hmm. in the bin. Yeah, got you. Um, do you ever use non-natural amino acids in your optimization? Uh, no, for the same reason. The technology there is not really that mature for us to be able to use it on scale yet. Understood. Um, and then just back to sort of clarifying a couple of points in terms of your uh, process. So you are, um, how many enzyme variants are commonly used in your processes? I think you said 10 to 100, but maybe just... Uh, yeah, exactly. So for, for any given screening round, we will find ourselves with between 10 and 100 variants to screen. That's, uh, um, and then with regards to your, um, the, the, the 60 mutations, uh, in this case there, do you have, just to confirm, you evaluate these in combination or in individually, um, was just a, uh, yeah. So in, in silico, they're evaluated fully combinatorially. Yeah. And then experimentally, we are evaluating them combinatorially, but not necessarily all at once. So mm. we are reducing the level of mutation to try and be able to then deconvolute them later. Um, for fun, sometimes we do allow all possible mutations that came out of the in silico just to see if the protein survives. And that, that yeah. can always often be an interesting experiment. Yeah. And then a, a question, I, I guess, that's very specific to your, um, your proprietary technology uh, and the parameters of using that, which is, um, do you have to engineer your proteins to minimize leaching from the glass supports that you use in bioprocess? So is, is protein leaching a, a parameter that you, you have to measure for? Uh, protein leaching is something we have to look out for. It can be process dependent, so it can depend on reaction conditions, um, but there are workarounds for that that we are, have, have developed and are developing that I won't say too much about right now. Yeah. Uh, but there, there, are, there are workarounds for that. Um, but in terms of engineering the enzymes themselves, we can benefit by having certain physical properties on the surface. Um, because we have secondary interactions, not just the his tag, we have secondary interactions. We can deliberately engineer to benefit those. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I'll, I'll just, there's actually tons of questions, Matthew. So I'm just going to keep going for a little bit longer if that's all right with you. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so a, a few people asking about the computational tools that you're using for the in silico mm -hmm. analysis. So uh, question here from anonymous attendee, what types of computational tools are you using? Uh, and a similar question, what's the software that you're working with at the phylogenetic filtering stage? Uh, I think that was. Oh no, so uh, yeah. So what? Uh, I guess first question was what? What's the uh, computational tools you're using for the in silico analysis? Uh, we use a number of different tools. Uh, we use anything from molecular dynamics all the way up to various types of uh, more simple atomistic modeling tools. Um, I don't know if I want to say exactly which tools we're using, yeah. but we use <laughs> we we use we use whatever we can get our hands on a lot of the time because almost all of them are wrong. Uh, and so by amalgamating them together, you can get yourself to a, a better guessing point. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then one that's perhaps specific to the industry. Do, do you have an enzyme platform for typically high waste generating reactions such as nit nitration? Is that... uh, no, we don't. No, we don't have that. I was thinking that there have been, I have seen people who have been interested in enzymatic nitrations, but it's not a chemistry that we have uh, dabbled in yet. Yeah, and I, um, 
All right, still still coming in. Sorry. Um, so, question from Pradeep: uh, How modular is the platform specifically um, regarding the simulations? Are there certain enzyme classes for which you found better predictivity in the modeling? Uh, there certainly are, especially. I, I don't know if I would say classes, but I would say actually the ones that are better annotated are often much easier for us to work with. So if you're finding an enzyme from a particularly rare class or a particularly obscure chemistry, um, then we find that our models often get muddied by the sequences that are contaminating that space. So if not necessarily when we're just looking for specificity, for, for stability, but if we're looking for specificity in particular, um, where the differences between certain proteins are quite subtle, then, then we find that the models tend to, to break down and be just guessing. Okay. And then I think uh, one final question, because you've, you've already answered uh, 14 at this point. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I, I think it highlights the interest in, in the topic. So thank you, Matthew. So um, you, you highlight your use of um, sequence analysis for mm -hmm. designing the mutations in your, in your enzyme. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Beyond that, are you using structural information to, to inform the, the novel mutations or, or what additional parameters do you use uh, beyond the sequence to, uh, to design your, your mutation type? Yeah, so the, the, the choice of the sequence is really the, the, the phylogenetic step is because most of the atomistic models that we use are inherently not that good. Uh, there, there is the state of the art is not that good for these atomistic models. Mm. And so the phylogenetic step is trying to give them a bit of a helping hand by removing things that are completely way out there in terms of space. Yeah. Um, and then the atomistic models are, are really what's doing the heavy lifting in terms of predicting which mutations can be introduced. And that that's all structural, of course. Um, one, one subtlety for us is that the, the structure is really important um, and, and we found a lot of the time going from crystal structures is not a very good place to start. There are a lot of artifacts and a lot of oddities mm. in crystal structures that just don't represent biological reality. Yeah, I, I have to ask one more question because it's related yeah, no uh, from Justin. So um, in at the phylogenetic filtering stage, random mutations that do not exist in nature uh, will get filtered out. Would you mm -hmm. consider including some of these mutations that are recommended by machine learning algorithms to truly realize de novo protein design? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, however, at least for the, the, the work I was describing here, what's really important to us is to make progress in the right direction. So we're really throwing everything we can to filter out junk and most mutational space is empty. But if, if we had a model that started predicting that okay, we know we have trained on this and we know that these improve the protein. And now we're predicting away from observed biological space, but still confident um, mm. that this is going to work, then, then by all means. Um, but in the first instance, what's often the most important for us is quite frankly, to move quickly and to start showing that we can improve this protein. Yeah. There's, there's really no point in us screening a thousand things and seeing nothing. It's better for us to screen 10 and show that it, we could make it better. Yeah. Well, Matthew, I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop there on questions, but I do just want to um, ask if our audience want to reach out and contact you, what, what, what would be the best way, way to reach you? Because there are quite a few questions and we will send them over to Matthew afterwards with your names where you've included them. But there's a few anonymous ones as well. So okay. is there a good place to, to reach you? Um, uh, yeah, emailing me as Enzyme is probably the easiest way to do uh, it. OK, uh, so we shall um, provide uh, that, that email address to audience yep. members who reach out to us to ask for it. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Well, um, Matthew, thank you once again for a fascinating presentation uh, and for Absolutely. sticking with us for at least 15 minutes of questions afterwards <laughs> as well. Um, and thank you to our audience members today for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye for now.